Hi, and welcome into this Telstra virtual event. I'm Justin Cleveland. Before we dive too far into cloud, I do want to uh, spend a moment discussing what you could do with the Telstra virtual events platform. Uh, feel free to move around and resize the boxes on your screen. You can submit your comments via the Q&A box. And how deep we go in this discussion depends entirely on you. So uh, feel free to discuss uh, just about anything, and we'll be taking your questions throughout the uh, course of this presentation. So back on topic, I think it's safe to say the cloud as a concept is somewhat confusing. And having a solid cloud strategy, well, it can result in productivity gains and cost savings for your business, but if it's deployed incorrectly, it can cause confusion in your office place and also leave you open to security breaches. Now, that all said, there's no one perfect cloud solution. What's right for your business depends entirely on the needs of your business. Your value as an IT professional also depends on you staying abreast of the latest changes and adapting to new programs and potential come to light. So today we're talking about how to identify what is right for your business, how you can adapt your skills to make you a more valuable person in a cloud-based environment, and how Telstra can help you build the right solution. So with no further ado, let's uh, discuss this today. I'm happy to welcome in Simon Alicia from Pivotal. Welcome, Simon. Thank you. Uh, also joining us uh, from Telstra is Michael Osipov. Michael? Hello, everyone. And also from Telstra is Tim Ott. You can learn about uh, all of these gentlemen by uh, clicking on the speaker bios uh, down at the bottom of your screen. So uh, before I hand things off to Simon, I do want to uh, involve you in the audience uh, and ask you a question, which is how advanced is your organization in its move to the cloud? If you had to quantify it, would you say that you're just beginning your transition? Would you say that you've moved the first 5% of your workloads? Are you considering the move to your next Fifteen percent, or are you uh, in the process of moving that next fifteen percent? So uh, feel free to um, uh, give us an answer there. And Simon, I'm going to turn this over to you. Uh, when you're working with a variety of businesses, and even in your own business, are, are you seeing uh, a general move to cloud? Are people more comfortable with the concept of cloud now than they've been in the past? Yeah, certainly. I think over the last few years, there's been a big evolution in market acceptance and comfort with the concept of cloud, the benefits of cloud, etc. As with many. Uh, IT changes and trends and transformations that take place, there's a period of time of adaptation and understanding. And uh, certainly we went through probably 2011, 2012, a big period of education um, and, and understanding. In the last couple of years, we've started to see adoption at a rapid pace. This is actually great uh, news from our audience is that they are 61.5% are uh, moving the next 15% of workload. So they are fairly advanced uh, in terms of our audience. So that's great to know. Uh, not saying we're going to exclude you, those of you who are in the beginning stages of your transition, but uh, it's good to know where a, a variety of our audience are. So let's talk about uh, the skill set that we need to adapt in, in modern cloud, because it was easy in the past. I knew how to solder. Uh, therefore, I'm good enough. I can take care of everything. Uh, but even fixing a computer these days is not enough. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's a significant change to the skill sets that people need to have. And one of the things I often talk to IT professionals about is challenging their thought process around how they do things and the speed at which they do things. One of the key things that we're seeing from modern IT is the ability to move exceptionally quickly. Gone are the days of the six-month, 12-month project. People want instant gratification. It's part of a generational change, it's part of technology change, it's part of what we're used to from consumer-based services that we deal with all the time. So as a professional, you need to give yourself the tools to do that. In many cases, that's reorienting away from maybe some of the more traditional hardware-oriented skills to more software-based skills. Certainly in Australia, we're seeing the resurgence of the developer as an important asset to organisations. We've sort of come out of that offshoring trend that we had back into onshoring. Uh, from an infrastructure perspective, the infrastructure folks I see being really successful are the ones who are adopting uh, infrastructure as code, who are leveraging platforms, who are learning how to develop systems themselves, who are building dynamic tool chains that can get things happening faster. And what I mean happening faster, I mean being able to release products to their customers uh, every day, to be able to increase little changes every day, to be able to move more quickly in their IT department every day. And uh, one of my colleagues in the US often says, you know, there's, there's not many CEOs these days who stand up and say, great job this year, team, you installed more servers than last year. Now, it's just not valuable anymore. It's about what you're doing with that infrastructure, how you're bringing that infrastructure to bear. Where cloud makes this much more different than in the past is because everything's accessible via an application programming interface, you've got to know how to drive that thing. You've got to make it do what you want to do in the time frames you want to do it in. So I want to bring things a little bit back. You mentioned the, the trend to bring more staff on board, which may seem counterintuitive to some businesses as they hand off more things to a network that's in the cloud. I mean, server stacks are, are going away from mm -hmm. businesses. Mm -hmm. What's the benefit to having that person on the ground? 
So really it's about having the people who know how to drive the clouds effectively. And, and you, there's a trend at the moment called DevOps, which is about bringing the developer community and the operations community far more closely together. And really bridging those two skill sets. Whereas in the past we had very separate skill sets of the people who created the product and people who ran the product, now they've become one and the same. Because there is less work to be done to stand up infrastructure to manage and maintain infrastructure, those people can spend more time understanding what they're actually running mm -hmm. and why and what it means to the business. So that's where those skill sets become really important. Wonderful. Well, uh, let's talk about some of the things then that we can do within the business, particularly dealing with, with projects. So you've got the people on staff. What's the best way to use them to get the best possible outcome? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really a case of empowering your staff and letting them free. Uh, one of the things we saw in the past, in the, if you like, in the pre-cloud era, was that decisions around uh, infrastructure and big projects were very high risk because there was a lot of upfront cost. Obviously, these days, it's pay-as-you-go, pay for what you use, so there is no risk, essentially, except maybe the cost of a pizza or <laughs> expensive cup of coffee, what have you. So, really, if organizationally, organizations let small teams work effectively with a very clear goal, the outcomes they get are amazing. And we're seeing this evidence uh, with things like hackathons, where different groups of the business will get together that may not normally work with one another and create new products that actually could become genuine products of their organization or simply solve an internal problem they've been having for a long time. And you'll often hear organizations say, we can't get this particular piece of information in the hands of this employee mm -hmm. in a time frame we need. And it actually only took two people or four people together for two days with the right tools to make it actually happen, rather than having a big uh, a business case, lots of meetings, lots of analysis, etc. We avoid all that. Yeah, really exciting. so it's cloud getting us away from the, the meeting structure. Uh, before we were uh, we went on air, we were talking about how much uh, none of us like meetings. Uh, <laughs> we, I don't think anybody's ever sat down and said, you know what would be great if we had a meeting. More meetings, more meetings. It, it's, it's, it's true. Uh, one, one of the things I've often liked to do in, in my own cloud heritage is when I've gone into a meeting with a customer we're talking about a particular outcome they're trying to get, <coughs> is I'll actually have sufficient automation ready to go to actually kick it off at the start of the conversation. So that by the end of the conversation, the outcome we were just talking about already exists. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like a mind-blown situation because what used to take weeks, months, lots of cycles is not hard anymore. So which means you have to put the effort into that decision-making, which means you have less meetings, which is obviously a good thing, uh, and you actually just get outcomes, which is what you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about the infrastructure issues. Um, what do we need to have in place in our businesses in order to take advantage of the technologies that are out there? Yeah, so one of the challenges I see, look, there are many challenges that have to be faced, but one of the key ones I see is organizations trying to make a dramatic shift in the way they're operating, but not paying any attention to the tooling or platforms that they have in place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can't make change if you don't make change. So if you say, guess what, we're going to start delivering new versions of our product once a week, we're going to have a team of 20 developers, we're going to be doing showcases every second week, but you still have to go through the same change control, it still takes six weeks to do a change to the firewall, and um, you can't have any automation tools you're doomed to failure. It will not work. It starts with actually looking at your environment saying, I need the appropriate platform to deploy applications to, to empower my development mm -hmm. team, to help my operations team to be more efficient. And it's really interesting. I remember hearing about Facebook. You know, one of the things they do with their new employees is they focus them on deploying code on their first day. They want them to be, to be actioning what they're doing. And they can only do this because the best developers at organizations like that work on the platform, not on the actual functions, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. Yeah, fascinating. So uh, it seems like we're in a point where we want to give businesses the ability to scale quickly. Um, the problem I think a lot of people are, are worried about is buying too much. You know, yeah. they, they're buying more capacity than they necessarily need. And yeah, that's great for future proofing. But you know, how do we how do we balance that out? Yeah. So there's, there's two parts to that. One is we talk a lot to to people about building scalable systems, distributed systems using good technologies and good methodologies. And one of the things we certainly do at Pivotal is we, we take an opinionated view and we say, here's how you need to deploy your application. Here's how it should be built. Here's how it should be run. So it can grow when it needs to. But on day one, it could be very small. And because we're leveraging cloud, we're leveraging an elastic resource, we know it can grow when we need to if we build it the right way up front. What the problems of the past have been is because we're using a very much a vertically scaled model, a monolithic model, where we've said, well, you need to figure out the biggest box you're ever going to possibly need, and if you get beyond that box, right. you're out of luck. We're not working that world anymore. So there's a few design patterns that have changed. And again, 
having a very uh, opinionated platform to drive in that direction actually helps get you to the outcome really quick. Yeah. So I do want to remind you in the audience, we're taking your questions, and it's really going to drive our conversation today, so feel free to uh, engage us through the Q&A box there on your screen. Uh, one of the questions that did come in from Roger was about security and, and the ability to secure, make sure that your cloud deployment is secure. Uh, one of the things that uh, it, there's a concern about, and that's shadow IT, uh, in essence means that uh, employees are using things that make their job easier even though they may not necessarily be secure. Mm -hmm. For example, they're using Google Drive instead of uh, Box because they, they're just more comfortable with it, but that also opens your business up to security holes. So the question is, does security, I, uh, does Shadow IT exist within your organization? No, all employees use officially sanctioned apps, programs, and processes. Uh, we're running a two-speed IT department, so mostly uh, official, but a little bit of people doing things on their side. Uh, you're in the process of formalizing what was Shadow IT, so if everybody was using Box before, why not make it a corporate process now? Or we fully internalized and productized what was Shadow IT, so now we're up and running, we've got Box, everybody's using it. Uh, let me know your answers there. Uh, and Michael, I'm going to hand this off to you because we are in a position where uh, cloud, even a couple of years ago, was sort of a concept for most businesses, but now in consumer and in business, I mean, it's here. Yeah, without any question, uh, having seen the results of the last poll, I don't think there's any doubt that the world has gone cloud. I think there's no longer a debate. There was various versions of it. If you've been around the industry a long time, you've seen them all utility and, uh, and hosted services, and it's nothing particularly new. But... I want to draw it back to why people are doing it. And you start off with, you talk to chief executive officers of companies of all different sizes around the country. I was, was, was watching to one and listening to one the other day. He said, you know, 80% of what we do in our company in terms of better serving our customers, chasing cost out of our business, differentiating our products and services, making the organization more secure, and better engaging their staff. Now, these are five things which everybody wants to do. He said 80% of it is directly related to how we use technology. And he said, I started my business not because I wanted to be a technologist, but it's absolutely at the center of everything we do. So 80% of it's connected to that. He said, the biggest bet in terms of an opportunity is if I get technology right. And the biggest risk I have running a business is if I get technology wrong. And then you go and talk to the technical guys who work for this guy. He said, you know, what we used to do this is CIO. He said, we used to spend 60, 70, 80% of our ICT budgets on infrastructure. And it's wrong. We have to work out a way of inverting it to spend 20, 30, 40% on infrastructure. Unlock all that value in capital which we used to spend building ourselves servers and running data environments and running our software. We have to take all that money, unlock it to drive innovation and to move it closer to the customer. And so for them, they can see this is a fundamentally different way of doing things. And the CIO went on to say, you know, we're doing deployments of new application functionality in 45-day increments as opposed to once a year or twice a year. And he said that now we can take an idea which would take, in the old days, maybe um, a million dollars to evaluate to see whether it makes sense, and then a build time of 18 months at a cash burn of about a million dollars per month. So think about the math on that. It's the best part of 20 million, the best part of 18 months in the product and the offering, the apps in the market. He said today, that same thing, because we've re-platformed to a hosted environment, we use the best of whatever we require when we need it. So today, that same process, 90 days to test the idea, and we're in the market um, at a cost of $10,000. And so that's the dramatic change which has taken place. And if you think, oh, well, that's all good for big companies, that's not necessarily where the game's at. When you look at taking software as a service and you look at our 1.1 million small, medium customers, many of whom have dialed in today, I look at the way they use software as a service. The first 100,000 customers to take Microsoft products from us as a hosted service, as a cloud offering, took three years and three months, 39 months. The second 100,000 came up in 15 months. The third 100,000 came up in nine months. The fourth 100,000 came up in five months. But more importantly, Look at how many people come to cloud and leave. And you know what the dropout rate is, everyone? It's 2%, which means once you're in, you're in. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, if you say, I'm not sure I'm ready for, I'm not really sure I'm going to get from here to there, the problem is, if you're slow to move, and one of your competitors does, they're going to have a better cost base. And if they've got a better mousetrap, it puts your organization under duress to play catch-up. And so if anything, what we're hearing from the clients I speak to, and I see a whole range right across the marketplace, is how can I accelerate the deployment? 
And how can I do it in a way in which it is more secure? The question about security is really interesting. Anyone who tells you clients not secure is crazy. It's more robust, more secure than you would ever build for yourself. But I think it's a very rapidly evolved marketplace. But in my mind, it's a commercial discussion as much as a technical discussion. It's unlocking value to move closer to your customers to create innovation, which would previously have been spent running a commoditized product, which really is a waste of time and effort. That's actually, uh, I think, a, a very fascinating point. Uh, we'll uh, jump back to the poll here just very quickly. It looks like uh, most of our respondents are at least aware of the shadow IT. If you not, don't call it a problem, they're at least aware of shadow IT. When you say people are jumping in with a very low dropout rate, you, you may want to get up to speed and use Dropbox because, you know what, that's how you share pictures of your kids. Uh, but find out once you get deployed in your business, it's not the proper business solution. That means that you at least understand the processes that are in place and can find something that is more appropriate. And, and there are trials and errors within cloud. It's not like it's going to be up and running day one and it's going to be the perfect solution. Uh, I don't it's also helping you to identify gaps that you have in your own environment. So I, I would tell TIA that Shadow IT is the biggest gift they've got. Because it's showing all the areas that they should be developing in, they've got opportunities to improve. Because people don't do things for fun. They do things because they're trying to solve a problem. Right. And you know, we, the file sharing one is a, is a very common one. It was always hard to share files in an organization. Now there's 30, 40 different ways to do it. Now you can choose the one that suits your organization from the vendor of your choice. You go, exactly. You go and look at governments who are fascinated with security. Some of the biggest users of Dropbox work in government agencies. Why? Because they can't share information. And then once the agency has this pointed out to them, they say, well, that's not part of our policy. But the point about it is the policy sometimes doesn't catch up with what you actually need to deliver as a, as a business, whether it's in government or whether it's in a private enterprise. And so the public, the consumer who comes to work for you, is more enabled than ever before, and they're going to come in and do this because they need it to be able to perform their role. So it's up to the IT folks and psychiatrists to get out of the way and enable their staff to perform their duties in a responsible, effective, quick fashion. And you take security and treat it as just another managerial function. You can build a model around it to support it, and you navigate your way through it as opposed to saying, absolutely, we'll never do it because it's just too difficult and too slow. Yeah. And, I'm, and it's unreasonable in yeah. today's market. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question came in from Travis, which I think uh, might be appropriate for you, Tim, um, though everybody's more than welcome to jump in on this. Uh, he asked a question about uh, cloud-native built applications. He says that a lot of enterprise applications aren't necessarily cloud-native. Uh, so what, what do you think about the future of applications? Are we going to see a lot more uh, develop in this space? Uh, I, look, there's a lot of uh, the legacy applications from the big vendors that are, are not moving, mm -hmm. and that's I think, uh, you know, indicative of how some of the, the participants in the market are still struggling to change from existing delivery and commercial models to the new reality of cloud, where it's consumption, scalable, you know, pay and receive it when you want it, not pay in advance and take the risk. And it does talk a bit to uh, the, the way that these companies need to evolve. So I, I think we, uh, we will not necessarily see a whole re-architecture of these applications because it's immensely expensive uh, and does require uh, a lot of work from these vendors, what we're likely to see is them to start to build uh, the SaaS-like application. We already see Oracle and others deliver software as a service. They're not driving a lot of customers onto that at the moment because it's probably not in their interest from a commercial perspective. But inevitably, despite them being slow uh, to adopt, adapt, sorry, they're going to need to adapt to the new realities of cloud. Well, I know so some signs but it, it needs to happen more quickly, and these companies are, are not going to be relevant if they don't do it. Well, I know there was a big pushback against Microsoft when they went Office 365, mm. largely because for the previous 20 years, I bought my copy of Office, I had the disk, and it was mine. So think about your laptop that you have there in front of you. Who were they disrupting? They were disrupting themselves, but Microsoft were happy to do that. Their biggest disruption was their channel partner. Who was their channel partner? It's HP. Toshiba or any other OEM manufacturer that bundled the OS, that bundled the office, bundled all of those applications onto the hardware and sold it. That was an easy path for Microsoft, but of course they've got to change. So everyone along through this value chain has to be pre prepared to be disrupted, not only the end user. The end users are, are the one driving disruption. We talk a lot, and I, I think you know, Michael and, and Simon made a really good point about this is the demand in many cases is in shadow IT is being driven not by the line of business, which is, to be honest, what a lot of times uh, providers like us talk about, dealing with the demands of the line of business rather than IT. It's actually being driven by the end user. Mm -hmm. 
so that's a very interesting model, and I think end user driven ultimately is where we see this going. Yeah, it's a good learnings in that though, Tim. But one of the ones I want to go back to is if anyone sits there thinking I need to move everything to the cloud, mm. that's certainly not true. There are certain applications which were born native mm. cloud, which is which is logic. But just because you've got an old dog, you don't go and put it down. So if you've got a system which works incredibly well, mm. you continue to use it mm. until you reach a point where you say, hey, there's no more value in continuing to, to sweat this asset. Yeah. Or if the volume of transactions which are going through it then need to connect to something, say, for example, a digital service. At that point, then you look at re-architecting. But for those who are running systems which you either call them legacy or heritage, whatever term you want to use, if they're performing the function today and they're really efficient at what they do, leave them in place. Mm. You may choose to augment that service by treating them as a hosted offering which just runs on someone else's equipment, which means you can lower your cost to actually serve them up. But the idea that you have to replace absolutely everything is not the, not the case today. And we're seeing that throughout all industries, all marketplaces. Yeah. That's a good point because what you know, with, with Telstra talks about uh, hybrid, it's not about hybrid cloud, it's about hybrid IT. So as, as Michael said, it makes sense to move to cloud where you get the benefits of cloud, so scalability uh, and, and the consumption model. If you're already invested and deployed and you have a fairly stable environment, you may find not only are you not getting possibly the service and performance you need from the, uh, moving to the cloud, but you may pay higher costs and there's higher costs for the variability offered by cloud. So yeah, it is a hybrid IT environment and it is all about sourcing to the right environment for the needs of your workload or your particular functional or, or performance requirements. A big part of this is <clears throat> the evolution process. And we, we, we tend to get fixated in, in IT with sort of current state, future state, mm. vision. And I just like that model a lot. I prefer thinking of it as waypoints. Because we're moving along a continuum, we're always changing, we're always learning, so there'll be some assets we sweat for a long time, the systems I worked on 25 years ago, they're still running. Now, there's nothing wrong with them. They don't have to go to the cloud. They can still do what they need to do. But new stuff that I'm building, I need to have an eye for the future. How should it look? It's not going to be the way I built 10 years ago. It won't be the way I built three years ago. Things will always change. But you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. You just keep evolving and improving. And to Michael's point about that, that cost-based change, as you're freeing up some of that infrastructure capital that you're getting back from refreshing some of these systems, that goes into the innovation pot, and that becomes a self-fulfilling Excellent. I want to jump back out to the audience for uh, for another question for you. It's uh, does your organization have the IT skills to meet the demands of a cloud environment? Do you, are you confident in the personnel you have on staff now, or could have uh, in very short order? Uh, number one, we are still a traditional mainframe on-premise team. Uh, we are trying to add new blood to the team, but are feeling tension between the old and new. Uh, we have expanded with new people and new skills, and are moving toward becoming a cohesive team or you've successfully made the transition and are operating largely in the cloud. Uh, go ahead and populate those uh, results for me. And Tim, you've been working with a lot of businesses that are uh, you know, making the transition to the cloud. Maybe this is a stilted measure, but I mean, what are you seeing out in the marketplace? Are, are people accepting the move to the cloud? Well, I think uh, it is disruptive for, for businesses. People whose jobs uh, they perceive are under threat, who are used to doing or performing their activities in a certain way, and we see it as well right across the board with some of the partners who work with our customers. They are very much used to work and comfortable working in a certain pattern with customers. Uh, but I think in the main, we, we're starting to see the transition uh, and, and, and adoption of cloud by these customers, starting to see people accepting of that and starting to see that this actually frees them up to focus on more interesting problems. So rather than focusing on you know, the operational side of the business uh, and, and, and really being caught in that day-to-day -day, uh, operation process, it's freeing people up to look at the bigger picture. So we've got great examples of some of our customers, uh, their, their IT group, looking really more at customer productivity, mobilising their workforce, enabling much more flexibility uh, for their employees. And that, that's really exciting. That's, they perceive and they do get a lot more value out of enabling that, changing the way people work, changing the way people's lives work. We see people, uh, users in our, in our customers, getting their lives back, getting more free time back. And that, that is, that's of high value to these people. Yeah. And on the partner side, you know, they're getting access to more interesting problems within their customer base too. So the ability to look deeper into their customers' business processes, looking deeper into their customers' customers, and working with their customers to see how they can drive value. 
So we're starting to really see that move to, uh, I guess, a higher level uh, engagement with customers and with internal users from the traditional uh, delivery of uh, people who deliver IT service. Yeah, so in uh, the results of our poll, about half of our audience have made the successful transition, which is great, but about half are also still struggling with it uh, and are moving toward that goal, which is excellent. So do you think that's going to be a generational thing, that in just 10 years uh, we'll have all adopted the cloud and that will just be standard operating procedure? But I, don't, I don't think the word cloud will exist in 10 years. Really just be another uh, service delivery mechanism. I think what we're seeing is, is cloud is based around tech. We spend a lot of time talking about technology. Um, what we should be talking about is those things that, that Michael and, and Simon talked about before was the innovation cycle, the consumption model, and the fact that we're being freed from the constraints that, that you know, large budgeted, long time delivery projects have, have, have placed on the innovation in business. So now cloud provides a lot more certainty of delivery provides a lot more scalability mm -hmm. and a lot more low cost entry for, for, for ideas and innovation. So I think that will become the new norm. Mm -hmm. I don't think we'll be talking about cloud uh, and I think what we'll be doing is looking at how which workloads are the best place to go where based on the parameters uh, of that particular workload. Yeah, and that gets us into our next topic, which is you know the dynamic nature of cloud. Um, the, we'll, I'll try to stop using the word, but I don't know that I can. Um, Ross asked the question here, what are the key elements when you're considering which cloud service provider to go with? I mean, what do you, where do you start with that conversation? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. So I think the important thing to think about is, is what your particular requirements are and what workloads and applications you're running in your business uh, and, and who can deliver those uh, and, and then the broadest range of those for you because when you think unfortunately we're at that point of the, the, the you know, development of the cloud market that there's no common standards, there's no common integration points, there's no necessarily even agreed security protocols and so forth. So really it's about trying to find the person who best lines up with your particular needs now and into the future. And, you know, when we look at cloud from Telstra's perspective, most customers, around 90% of customers, have a hybrid or multi-cloud environment as their target architecture. So, you know, that's, that's quite compelling reason to, to maybe not pick one cloud provider because most customers realise that they're going to have a mix of on-prem and cloud, they're going to have a mix of SaaS and IaaS, they're going to have a mix of you know, different vendors. Mm -hmm. So really looking at a provider, perhaps not looking at a cloud provider necessarily, but someone who can help you bring all of that together is important. Yeah, I think, I think it's important also to recognise that the relationship you have with your cloud provider is different to some of the previous relationships with infrastructure providers, which tended to be multi-year, multi-million mm -hmm. dollar long-term commitments. Now, in this case, not a marriage, it's a dating. <laughs> you, know, you, can, you can sort of opt out at any time. So where we see customers really gravitate towards is to say, how can I do things the same way across multiple providers? How can I have some sort of open standard, some sort of open sourcing, some sort of commonality, so that if I do want to chop and change, I can, or if I want to have a mixture, I can. Um, I'm not binding myself too closely to the way one particular provider mm -hmm. works and operates. Because there's no commitment on either side to stay there. You, know, you can move at any time. No one's expecting you to stay there the whole time. They'd like you to, but they can't force you to. Um, and if you don't bind yourself too closely to a particular provider, it means you do have that flexibility to move as your demands change and as the market changes. I mean, we've seen tremendous evolution in cloud providers, both big and small, over the last few years. And some are sort of going more niche to serve maybe specific developer needs. Others are more broad-based and saying we've got a bigger global footprint. Others are saying we have a better price performance ratio. It's a real, it depends, there's no one size fits all anymore. Yeah, and a part of that I think is the infrastructure and the nature of the infrastructure, which is why we're so excited for NBN because it's going to give us the ability to do a lot more. Uh, do you see that playing a role, and, and I guess that's for anyone, uh, saving the NBN or higher speeds uh, across Australia playing a role in, in development in business? Well, the thing, when you go back to this idea of where do you pick your cloud partner from, you, you, you can't disconnect the cloud or virtual or hosted offering from the network because it doesn't work without the network. And so tightly coupling these two pieces together, particularly if you think, well, we'll move one application from one cloud platform to another cloud platform, the second you do that, you then have to go and touch the network. So when you tightly integrate them together, that's critically important. NBN is another fantastic piece of infrastructure, but really what you don't want to be doing 
as a customer, is going out and saying, I'm going to move from that cloud platform to this cloud platform because it's more efficient, I'll save a few dollars, or it's got a bit of performance set of characteristics, and then have to go out and talk to the network provider underneath that to say, I need to change the characteristics of my network. It just creates this extra level of complication for really no upside. And what MBN does is it provides great new infrastructure, which means for many smaller organizations the opportunity to conduct their work from wherever they choose to conduct it from, whether it's in their office, whether it's on the road, or whether it's from, from home, is profoundly interesting. And the consumers that you'll be serving, they don't really care whether or not you're on the road. They don't care whether you're actually working from home. They don't care whether you're, um, you're, uh, you're um, in that state necessarily. What they want to get is some kind of an outcome. And so what better infrastructure will provide is Again, this virtualization proposition, you can deliver the services from where you want to. But if you couple together cloud and you couple together the network, it actually takes one level of complication out, which is unique. And also, if there's a demand for more capacity in your cloud environment, the network should automatically evolve to provide that to you, as opposed to you saying, ah, I need more infrastructure in the cloud world, I've got to go and boost my network. The second you're doing that, you're defeating the whole purpose of going to this virtual world. Yeah. And so there are some really big reasons to partner up with someone that does it naturally. And if you think about it intellectually, a telco in premise is a cloud. It's always worked that way. The telephone, all the clever action takes place inside the network. And all you're getting as a person sitting there making a phone call is an application which is making a voice telephone call. How the network operates is academic. And that's why telcos are good at that kind of thing. They're really good at delivering that type of managed type service. And that's that you know, common offering or brokered offering, call it whatever you want to. But that provides you with some significant advantages in how you will actually deploy it and manage it and operate it inside your organization. I have two, cloud is, is a lot about mobility too. So it will be great for customers, you know, the MBN, sorry, I mean, so for those uh, customers that are on prem and want to use cloud, but mobility is key. A lot of about cloud is creating more flexible work patterns, and that has a big implication for where you are and how you work. And I think mobility is really central to cloud. So, you know, the mobile network is going to be amazingly important for the new work patterns, new work processes. Uh, we have in the future. And all the connected devices that people are taking for granted now. I mean, yes. I think for many people, they get better performance from their 4G phone than they get from they their, their home get phone. phone. But you follow that logic through. So I'm actually performing company business and I might be using my tablet to do that. Now, I fundamentally have to make sure that that wireless device conforms to all the standards it, right. as my desktop computer would. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a security model which is built so that if it gets goes missing or it's stolen or I lose it, no sensitive corporate data goes. How do those corporate services get delivered? Those mobile security services, they're hosted offerings. They're just another cloud application. And so the point is you can now redeploy your workforce to reflect the nature of how your company actually functions, but still hand on heart say it's secure, it's robust. If a device goes missing, we can recover it quickly and we're not exposed in any way, shape or form. And again, it's the same kind of model. It becomes a case of monkey see, monkey do it. That's how the offering is provided by one of your competitors, the natural players you'll need to keep up. And if you just look at what's been happening for those who are listening to this call, Sydney's just suffered from a massive series of rainstorms which are taking place. So all the insurance assessors are out there at the moment visiting properties which have had water damage or trees falling down. You couldn't do that job today without a tablet. You couldn't do that job without taking photographs. Okay. You couldn't do that job any other way. And how is it being delivered to them? It's all a hosted offering. And I can't think of a single company that I go and interact with which says, no, mobility has got absolutely no, no relevance to it. It's just kind of how it is. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't get your skill set to that point, you will actually wind up with a whole bunch of folks working for you with obsolete skills. And companies that employ people have got a duty of care for their employees, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. to make sure they always have you know, services and skills which are actually useful in the market. And so if you say, I'm not coming to the world of virtual and hosting, um, you know, effectively you sort of just... Winding up being someone who mm -hmm. says, I'm going to knit my own clothes. Because so we're seeing a lot of that now is, is staff coming into companies, looking around, seeing they don't have the right tool sets or aren't using the right applications and services, and they're out again because yeah. they don't want to work like that. In that they and if you don't want to work with the latest modern tool sets that makes it easy and, in fact, more enjoyable to come to work. And so it's interesting how that's flipped, isn't it, over the, you know, if you go back 20 years, the enterprise IT was well ahead of consumer yeah. IT. Somewhere in the last eight to ten years that flipped gotcha. and now it's all about business catching up and leading and going with that sort of consumer type experience. And this is why we talk about it 
being largely or to a significant extent end user driven, because end users, what they use at home, on the cloud, invariably on the cloud, people who don't get too excited about software installed on desktops no. anymore, uh, are looking for something similar or even better when they go to and, and, the, and the, you're right, the consumer experience is something that's driven the adoption of cloud really mm. heavily, because again, traditional IT had a very fixed constituent they were working towards. So yeah. Let's use the insurance assessor example, because it's a great one. Um, you know, I know I've got a company, I've got 20,000 insurance assessors, that's how much capacity I need to have. Now, I was involved in a car accident on the weekend. I went online and logged my case with the photos and everything completely online because the call centre is swamped by all the, mm. all the flooding at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I'm a user of their system. Now, in a traditional environment, that would have broken because, well, we can't have half a million people logging into our system. And well, the security the model's broken. Yeah, exactly. The, the scalable it. model, etc. none of that would work. But instead, I'm doing it myself. I'm saving that insurance company money because they're not having to yeah. allocate a yeah. call centre person yeah. to do it. I've got a better customer experience because I'm not on hold for an hour yeah. waiting, but the system has to be built such that it's, it's capable of doing that. I can tell you as a, as a consumer, if I'd logged onto that system and said, I'm down, I'm overloaded, etc., I would be finding a new provider because that's not good enough for me anymore. It's that easy to switch. Yeah. But they're able to be in that, in that place because they've evolved their IT away from where it was five years ago. But it's more important that the consumer is not comparing insurance company to insurance company. The consumer is comparing best customer service yeah. Yeah. to whoever they're talking to. Correct. So if you're a council or a bank or a telco yeah. or a smaller organisation, the same kind of mindset is, why can't that my hairdresser actually let me book an appointment myself? Mm. Why yeah. can't I see who's yeah. available and do it? Because I can do that with these range of other things. Yeah. And so the hosting virtual world actually has tremendous value for smaller organisations and the really neat thing is rather than have to build it all where it would have cost you all this overhead and resources and time, now you just take a piece of it. It's just a scale play. And the bigger the scale, the cheaper the outcome you wind up getting. But the expectation will be all consumers will expect the same type of services from all different providers. Correct. Yeah. And it's exciting, you know, as you said, working online with a provider. And, and this, is, this is a great opportunity to look back in the business as you go to cloud and look at opportunities for business transformation. You're not only resolving those problems that you've identified as barriers by going to cloud, you know, you may have chosen to scale with cloud, but you're, you'll also potentially expose problems up the line mm -hmm. that you didn't know you had because now you have much greater flexibility and part of this it's exposing some other areas for transformation, transition and innovation. So it's an exciting opportunity, I think, for all businesses to look at the opportunities that give them. Yeah. So let's talk about the, the scalability factor and sort of what, the, what Telstra's ICT strategy is. Yeah. I, so look, we, Telstra had a look at our strategy about a year or so ago and, and really we we're trying to find the ground where we could make a difference for customers and deliver most value. So in the past we built our own cloud infrastructure platforms, we built our own cloud services and we still continue to maintain to do that. But really what it came down to was how we could add value and, and address the needs of customers. So what we, when we looked at our customers, they wanted to use a range of different cloud services from different providers. So as I said before, about 80 to 90 percent of customers tell us that their law, their target architecture, if you like, is, that, is to use multiple services. We also knew that customers didn't want lock-in, mm -hmm. so they wanted freedom to move between providers if necessary. Mm -hmm. They were looking for performance and security um, out of the cloud services that they were using, and that they wanted an easy way to manage this and also to take control of shadow IT. So really, uh, we looked at that and we built our value proposition around those core things. So offering a choice of solutions and the ability to move between clouds. Uh, a choice of solutions being cloud services plus physical services, if you like, but those services that you, know, you already have under your desk or in your data center to be able to support those. We have a, a, all of this integrated into our network and security infrastructure. As uh, Michael was talking about, putting the same service delivery capability or the same flexibility into the network as we do, we become used to in cloud. So having a, a software-driven network that can scale up and down uh, and be purchased on an on-demand model, uh, and having those responsive to one another. So the cloud or the the IT infrastructure can call up more network infrastructure if it requires it, and do that without a person getting in the way and just do it for the time when it's required. So we never, we're never impacting the end user experience. We're scaling those things in sync. 
and it's safe on the network and provide feedback loop into the infrastructure. Uh, also to, to really um, to, to enable security parameters, end user performance and so forth. And the last one is all about putting this under a single service management layer. So enabling customers one spot where they can go and purchase, provision and manage services. So they're not having to drop into a lot of different provider portals with different user experiences, with different uh, right. technology and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, user interface type. So really trying to make it simple. And this is where we think logically Telstra fits in. Delivering over the network, connecting up lots of different providers and bringing it all together in a way that it's easy for people to use. Yeah, I think ultimately we don't care. We just want the best and we want it to work and okay. I don't want to have to think That's about right. it. That's right. So to that end, we find deals with Cisco and VMware and IBM and there's others on the way on the infrastructure side. We've been operating our, our software as a service aggregation platform for quite some time, delivering Microsoft, Semantic, McAfee and other services. But it's really about bringing it all together in one place, providing customers a single point of contact and making yeah. it simple. It's funny, uh, we, we first talked about the apps marketplace oh, about six months ago and I initially bristled thinking, well, you know, I've got my app store, that's good enough, I can find out whatever I need, uh, and have since become a con convert to the apps marketplace because it's exactly the ones I need, it's exactly the same ones that my, uh, my colleagues are using, we have very easy collaboration, I don't have to hunt for which Cisco Jabber app is the one that I want, I know exactly which one that I want, uh, and I have to become a convert to that because it, it just takes that stress away from the rest of my life, I can just go in and do what I need to do. Yeah, so we, we spent a lot of time looking at the, the processes that our customers are using uh, cloud services for and really trying to put together, you know, the best two or perhaps three providers in that space. So, as you say, you know, the, 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 the email, uh, security, the box, you know, collaboration, DocuSign, trying to bring that all together in one space and over time starting to link these together so that there's data interoperability between them. So, at the moment, very easy to access. You've got single sign-on, single bill, single um, support line for this, which we think is really important. A lot of these services you can only receive email support for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're very focused on providing the sort of same level of Telstra support that you get for our other products as you do for these software as a service or, or in other cloud products that perhaps you don't receive natively from the provider. So we're really trying to provide business with a a uh, good level of support, the sort of support they used to from Telstra. Yeah, see, that's the thing. You know, self-service is nice to a point, but I also want somebody to call up and say, "What's what should I be doing?" That's right. Yeah. So you know, it's, it's very hard to to get in touch with a cloud provider when they're overseas. The only method methodology is email. If you've got an urgent problem, how do you escalate? How do you get an immediate response? You know, with Telstra, we give you the ability to call us. Excellent. Uh, I do have one final question for you out there in the audience. As IT leaders, do you feel you sufficiently understood uh, or, or you, you have a sufficient understanding and the expertise needed to drive IT strategy in a cloud environment? Uh, you're not confident and you don't know who can help you, which means you weren't just listening to Tim. Uh, I know enough to be dangerous but still want to deepen my understanding. Uh, I've got the expertise, but it would be great to have a partner who can back it up or you're fully confident in your, in your cloud strategy and you feel like you can work it. Um, so that is, uh, uh, yeah, we want to hear that from you. Um, now, Michael, you were mentioning how you worked with a, a variety of companies that are, uh, are, are fairly confident or have, have been happy with their move to the cloud, but what about personnel? Are you seeing that they are, uh, in terms of personnel, confident for what's going to happen in the next five years? Well, again, if you go back a little bit, uh, there was, Particularly in government, there was a great reluctance to anything in a hosted way, and they said, "Oh, we can't do that because it'll be a, it won't be it won't be up to our level of security, and so it's going to be a risk." But they've come around and they've worked out that we can manage risk. It's just another management consideration which you need to put in place. But if you don't develop a healthy cloud environment and you don't have people working for you who are afraid with the latest tools, firstly, attracting people to come work for you if you're not using them is going to be hard. Right. As Tim points out. Secondly. You'll actually wind up with a bunch of folks who really have got very limited skills mm. in terms of getting a job mm. somewhere else. And if we don't develop a healthy cloud environment in this country, what it will mean is that all these jobs are going to go overseas. Now, no one really wants that as a great mm. outcome either. I mean, in all honesty, if we look at the contact centre marketplace in Australia, there's nearly 300,000 people. And it's going to change incredibly rapidly. And we're already seeing a lot of roles have been moved overseas. And into the future, it'll become more of a self-serve and a hosted marketplace. So we can say we don't want to 
go to that world. But the truth is, we don't have a lot of choice in it. And so it's a case where whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, it simply is the way it is. And so for customers and their employees and the expectations of serving their, um, the, the people that they serve, their consumers, their, um, their stakeholders, they need an environment which actually operates in this kind of fashion. So it'll be a necessary play to move into this. What I think is interesting is there's still an appetite for most of our customers to work out how they can move more quickly. I don't think there's an example of a company that I've seen in the last year that hasn't got some cloud functionality inside it. But the way in which they've got benefit from it, and you can see because they don't leave it once they've moved there, and now the challenge will be how can they accelerate that deployment. And it's still a step to go from, it's a great idea, I get the, I get the commercials, I get the flexibility, I get the agility, I get all the nice things to provide for me, but actually saying, I come in there and I've got all these bunch of servers and I'm going to be able to move it, but the key is to start and to develop, we think, a program to say, at the moment in our business, we have a series of things which we're really good at, which work really well, some things which are maybe not quite so good, and we have some big prizes if we can improve them. So identify where the prizes are, focus on those ones, and then accelerate the way in which you go to deploy them. And it might be a series of steps to get there. It might be, well, we've got an upgrade required to a bunch of servers, and we don't want to put the capital into that, so why don't I actually move that into a hosted environment? So it's my equipment now moving into a faster environment. That's good. And then maybe later on I'll turn it into a native cloud application, but you do it at your speed, and as per the nature of your organisation. So your company still does whatever it does, whether it's cutting people's hair or providing bank services or fixing broken cars when they get smashed up. That's what companies are good at doing. And the technology should enable them to get to that, that, that place as quick, quickly as possible. And the key thing, of course, then, is to create staff environments so they're engaged and they enable you to be efficient, they enable you to respond to the needs of your, your customers into the future, to be agile, to be innovative, and to unlock the you know, the full potential of your organisations. Quite honestly, for anyone who's listening in who works for a company today, if you said to yourself, if you were redesigning and starting from scratch, would you build it the same way? I suspect almost everyone listening would say, no, I wouldn't do the same thing. Or ask the question another way, what if Google set up the same type of business, would they build it the same way? And people say, no, they wouldn't. So if you know that, what's preventing you from moving? Mm -hmm. And the key to it is to move into this, not in a revolution, because that winds up being very bloody and people lose arms and limbs, not everyone goes ham happy, but if you're evolving into this at the speed of a Galapagos Island tortoise, it's too slow because the market is evolving too rapidly. And mm. think about your own consumer behaviour. Think about the way in which you expect to get information about your home loan or about a car being repaired. We want it live, we want it now. And then you look at your own business and say, do I actually man up and deliver the same exactly. way? Exactly. And so that's where you've got to get your, get your game to. So the idea is the partners give you the speed. If you try to do it yourself, you'll never get there. Yeah. So you use yeah. partners to get you a, a, a leg up. It's, it's a classic standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, yeah. One of the, the big dangers of sort of saying, well, I'm going to reinvent everything I'm going to do and I'm going to build it myself, you know, that's going to get thrown away or come across pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's why we see certainly a pivotal. We see people saying, well, you know, I need a platform to do this that I don't have to think about that someone else has built for me that I can then leverage and do stuff on top of that. Right. Get me going quickly, get me going in a reliable way, in a future-proof way, in a cloud-agnostic way, and let me worry about building the stuff that matters to my business. Yeah. Um, whereas if you like the, the sort of first generation go around as being, well, I've got to build this platform for myself, mm -hmm. and then I've got to now go build something useful to the business. Again, business doesn't want to hear you about building platforms, they want to hear about delivering value that you can get faster because you've got a platform. Mm -hmm. Just like Google has a platform, like Facebook has a platform, like LinkedIn has a platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the questions that came in is, uh, well, in, in responding to our poll question, particularly over 60% of our audience felt they have some skills but need more help, uh, which is, there's a, there's a giant marketplace for help out there. I mean, they, you go websites, there are forums, there are all of that, but uh, in terms of a trusted advisor, is there some place I can just go, somebody I can just call that can give me that consultation, that can give me a quick answer, uh, if only to point me in the right direction? Where's the best, what's the best way to do that? Interesting question. It depends, it depends on the partners you have at the moment. It depends on the partners that you want to have in the future. Mm -hmm. So what I would suggest is you're looking at your partner, you need to see a partner that is evolving their own business as much as they're trying to help customers mm -hmm. evolve theirs. Yeah. So if you've got a partner, for example, who's very much au fait with the old way of doing things but maybe a bit afraid of the new way, they're not going to give you necessarily the information you need to get. If you've got a partner, though, who said, well, we've disrupted ourselves completely, 
and we're going to be going all to the cloud. We've got you know, DevOps people, and we're familiar with Telstra Cloud, we're familiar with Amazon, we're familiar mm -hmm. with all these other things. We can give you some informed decisions. They're the ones to go to. You want to see people who are walking the talk, not just saying, oh, me too, me too. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the things that, that's the best way to sell for somebody who's not sure about their business, uh, and sell maybe the wrong term, but convince them that it's worth doing, is to just get them hands-on. Uh, yeah. I wasn't convinced about DocuSign until somebody sent me a contract and I, walking home, was able to sign off on it and get it back, and by the next morning, everything was in place and in process, which was phenomenal. Um, so where, where do we go to get these sorts of, of conversations about specifics um, and, and to kind of get hands-on? Yeah, um, with our marketplace, we do offer free trials on all the apps. So that's a great place to start with maybe a limited set of users in the business. Uh, and I think it does give you a, an easy way to assess whether that's going to meet your particular requirements. Uh, so that's on the, the Telstraps marketplace. Um, and I, I think, you know, a good way is to come in and, and have some of the Telstra people demonstrate. So, you know, we've got a lot of uh, ability to test, set up test accounts for customers mm -hmm. uh, and, and to trial things. So that's, that's probably a good way to start. But I, I, I like Simon's advice too. You know, talk to someone who's done it. Um, if, if your trusted advisor He's telling you that maybe you know to hold off going to the cloud. It's not secure. Uh, it's not going to give you what you need. Then I suggest that you you probably want to look for a, okay. a second opinion. Second <laughs> opinion, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, it's it's really seeing people who've done it, and you'll notice because they'll be doing business differently. They really will be. Yeah, which is a weird thing to say because we've been. I mean, even when we replaced processes 10, 15 years ago, the process was still the same. Now, even accelerating, it's you're, you're skipping steps. Yeah, and so, yeah. coming at problems differently. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, your, your example is a good one, the DocuSign one. I think in Telstra, uh, one of the big shifts for us was, you know, the people manager, they've now enabled a mobile app to do all uh, leave and attendance records and approvals and that sort of thing. To be able to do that on the, on the go mm -hmm. is very much changing. That's, that's, that, you know, it's not quite life changing, but it's, uh, it does change the way we work. And that's, that's ultimately, you know, one of the key deliverables here is changing the way you work, changing the way you deal with customers mm -hmm. and being much more agile and responsive to how they want to deal with you, you know, yeah. not being constrained by your systems or processes. Yeah, that's actually one of those questions that came in earlier was dealing with the work-life balance aspect of things. And maybe, right. Michael, this is your area to take up is, you know, is cloud going to have a positive or negative impact on our work-life balance? You know, I'm able to, as I said, after hours, sign a DocuSign and take care of business. So is it, is it going to be a good thing or a bad thing? Well, the good news with any um, wireless device, if anyone hasn't absorbed this yet, you can actually switch them off if you <laughs> love it. <laughs> but the, this sort of idea of work life balance is, um, is a puzzling one. We, we've blurred the lines together today, and you can say it's a bad thing. But by the same token, you can say, well, at least I can keep an eye on what's taking place in the office. If you're running your own business, it's important. If you're running a large company and you have a storm and you're an insurance company, you can't sort of wait till the, uh, till the rain's finished or till the following day. So many organisations, the way the consumer views them is, I need the service when I need the service. And the tool sets enable you to do that. Does it all have to be done where the computer tells the human what to do or alerts them to what to do? Most of that will become increasingly automated. In fact, if anyone's listening to this who does run a company today, if you're considering a new project, if you're thinking about it and you can't work out a way of automate it, I think very carefully about actually doing the project mm -hmm. because the truth is all these things will continue to evolve and there's always a better idea. So is it a good thing or a bad thing? I think work will become increasingly fluid. It will become increasingly uh, individualised. The device I might choose to use is a, is a tablet or an Android or an Apple. All that stuff in my mind is completely academic. It will make you more productive to bring a you know, a, 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 a bear to work, then, you know, go right ahead and do it. I think what you'll see is people will start to design their own jobs, mm. not choose their own job, but you'll actually have people saying, this is a way to optimise mm. it, and it'll come from within. Your customers will come into your business into the future, and once they do, in the example of Simon used, where the customer actually does their own insurance mm. claim, guess what? They're suddenly incredibly attached to you. That joins you together in a different way, and this is enabled by technology. Customers will become increasingly transparent and companies will be increasingly transparent. If you're going to be transparent, you better be buff. So the market will continue to evolve very quickly. But is it a good thing or a bad thing? It's like when they say, let's ban guns. All it means is that the sale of rope goes up. So it can be a good news story. But by the same token, you can use these things. So I would say it's a complicated thing. 
in that it's great, but if it's used in the wrong way, it can be a downside. Yeah. But, you know, again, if you're an optimistic kind of person, you see the advantages it brings for companies mm -hmm. and for customers, um, it's got to be a good news well, kind of story. It's interesting. One of the trends I've seen locally of late is a small cohort of people for whom their mission in life is to get a job and then make themselves unnecessary in that job by automating it away. That's actually a core competency. Mm -hmm. It's actually a really yeah. saleable core competency. Go to an organisation and say, you need to hire me because I have this set of skills. I'm going to work for you for a year, maybe two years, and by the end of that period, you will not need me anymore because I've automated away everything I used to do. And I'll go do it somewhere else. Yeah. And that's, that's the concept of designing your job and building an environment that's automated so that you don't need to be on call all the time that's just because you're reachable, you're getting phone calls all the mm -hmm. time. Now, if you're getting phone calls at night all the time, something is wrong. And just because you're contactable doesn't stop the problem that it's wrong. You yeah, right. avoid that's, that from happening. Absolutely. It's not a technology issue. No. That's a business that's issue. A business but issue. then it lets you focus on what's important. Exactly. So what it wind up doing, I suspect, is actually provide uh, better jobs for people as opposed to worse jobs mm -hmm. for people. Mm -hmm. And what it will wind up doing, and the big comment about, you know, my job skills will become obsolete into the future. Well, yeah, that's what's going to happen. But the type of skills which people are learning at university today are for jobs which don't presently um, have revealed themselves. They don't exist yet. And so if you work in the base and you need all that information, it's going to be too slow for you because you have to work out a way of dealing with the ambiguous. You have to deal with the fact that the consumer model is going to evolve and it might not come from your industry or your company. It might come from a different one altogether. And so, again, it's being open-minded to do that and not locking yourself into any hard points which will restrict your ability to move at the speed at which you need to move. The example I used right at the beginning where that company used to spend 18 months, million dollars a month cash burn, and then they release their offering. And today they do the same thing for $10,000 in 90 days. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the graphic which we need to think mm -hmm. about in our own minds. And in many cases, they don't do it themselves. They get a third party to say, you build it for me. And if I don't like it after three months, it's like taking the book back to the library and saying, mm -hmm. I'll just get another book out because I don't like this one anymore. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in our last minute, Tim, I'm going to turn it to you and say, you know, the, the consultation aspect, the, the cloud aspect, and how do we find out more about what Telstra can offer and what Telstra is doing? Yeah, the best thing is to get in touch with your, your Telstra uh, account executive, have a look at our website. We talk a lot about the different services we offer, uh, the different benefits they provide and also what they can do for your business. There's some good case studies there. Or, or head into a Telstra business centre. They're uh, business experts, they understand businesses uh, and can advise you on the best technology for your needs. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you very much for taking some time and joining us here today as we talk through some of the cloud ideas and progresses. Uh, obviously, this is a work in progress, even though we won't say cloud in a few years, uh, but we are going to continue to build on these ideas. So thank you to Tim Otten, thank Simon you. Alicia, and Michael Osipov for thank taking you. a few minutes joining us here today, and thank you as well. Uh, survey is going to pop up in just a moment. Let us know how we did and what we could deep dive into in the future. Thank I'm Justin Cleveland. This has been a Telstra Virtual Event.